it's something we've already seen with um, Xi Jinping, his um, very muscular foreign policy approach to territorial disputes in the South China Sea and elsewhere. Um, the difficulties with Japan uh, and with other countries uh, that make claims to uh, the Paracel, Spratly Islands, and so forth. So um, the uh, Senkaku Diaoyu uh, dispute has been another example of that. So I think, um, I mean, many of us, including myself, have been somewhat surprised actually with how. Um, aggressively uh, Xi Jinping seems to have dealt with these kinds of foreign policy issues that uh, one would think if he's a truly strong and confident leader that these kinds of issues um, could better be dealt with uh, in uh, a less confrontational manner. But, um, but that hasn't been the way in which he's handled them to date. So I think there is indeed the possibility that um, uncertainty and fragility of the economy at home could, uh, could lead to this kind of unrest. And uh, the, of course, the Chinese economy is so interdependent with the rest of the world economy uh, these days that a slowing of the Chinese economy is likely to have major repercussions on all of us, whether we're immediate neighbors uh, of China like India, like India, or more distant uh, like the United States. We are so interwoven with the Chinese economy in so many ways that a very serious downturn would, would have major economic uh, as well as other repercussions uh, for our countries as well. The hope is, and I think the evidence to date would suggest that this inevitable slowing, which we're already seeing and which has been predicted for some time by the Chinese leadership, uh, is being managed uh, reasonably well so far so that it looks like it's going to be a soft landing for mm -hmm. the Chinese economy. I do believe um, that the Chinese Communist Party does actually have certain wellsprings of whether one wants to call it legitimacy or um, support. Um, among the population that derive from its revolutionary heritage. The fact that the Chinese Revolution really did restore a sense of pride in China. Uh, it did restore Chinese sovereignty over a territory that had been uh, um, to some extent uh, fragmented and dismembered by imperialism. It restored uh, a sense of uh, pride in um, China's national unity and then in China's developmental progress under Mao with literacy rates and uh, healthcare longevity rates um, rising and in the post-Mao period with this exceptional economic success that China has enjoyed. So I, I think um, there is a kind of pride in the party and its accomplishments um, that is historically based but even more than that, I think that the Chinese Communist Party has done a remarkable job, really since 1921, since it was first founded, but particularly in recent decades, in making itself seem much more Chinese. So that although, in fact, the Chinese Communist system is imported from the Soviet Union, the institutions, the fundamental ideology that underpins that, system is an alien system imported uh, from abroad. Um, nevertheless, it has come to feel extremely Chinese. And uh, when people in China criticize the Communist Party, as they frequently do, they usually criticize it for being too Chinese, uh, for um, exemplifying certain unpleasant aspects of Chinese political culture, nepotism, corruption, and so forth saying the Chinese Communist Party, ah, it's just like the old imperial uh, government, or it's like the Guomindang or something. They almost never say it's bound to fall because it's like the Soviet Union. And I think the fact that the system has indigenized in such uh, a significant way also gives it a sense of legitimacy. People may think that it's performing badly, that it's quite corrupt, um, that it's um, overly nepotistic and so forth. Um, they may think that it's not going to last forever, just like the imperial dynasty and the nationalists never did not last forever. But the fact that they feel that it's essentially Chinese rather than a foreign import, I think puts the Chinese Communist Party 
in a very different situation from what we saw in Eastern Europe in 1989? It's a difficult question to answer, but I, I, don't, I don't share the confidence of many or the optimism, I might say, of many that um, once we see a slowdown in the economy, uh, it's curtains for the Chinese Communist Party.